bad. And then obviously today, after EG beating uh, beating TNC, it's like, well, no, NA, NA's, I mean, that's, TNC looked insane. I mean, mm -hmm. they looked crazy good. So I think that no ping, just uh, the third game was crazy. I mean, that, that definitely was like nerves galore because of the TI uh, prospects, mm -hmm. I think. But I think game one and game two uh, were just two high skill teams playing against each other. So I would not count Quincy Crew out. Uh, I think I think they can absolutely uh, take the series. For sure. I think no ping were unlucky with their bracket because out of all the teams they could have played first, they played a North American team who would know them better and would have played them more often. And we didn't really get a chance to see what they were made of. But at least it was an entertaining series. Um, I think something they said on the panel earlier is pretty cool, which is that T1 has only played one series, but they already look so well adjusted to the meta. It's true. Uh, we were looking up T1's stats earlier, and Cuckoo's last Broodmother game was in 2017. Before the Season 2 before DPC. Before Season 2 DPC. So he learned Broodmother just for this patch. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think uh, it's cool to see that this is like the only direct-to-playoff team that looks like they have adapted the meta in their, in their scrims in a way that has worked out for them in officials. And it, it seems like that just is an impossible storyline these days for no. whatever reason. I didn't believe in that narrative before, but then it's like four playoff teams getting knocked out. How can you, I mean, at a certain point, it, it's not coincidence. On the flip side, most of those teams were already qualified for TI. So if you want to buy into the theory of no. saving... Okay, good. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that there's any no. real water to hold in that argument, yeah. especially at a major like this. Stakes are high, and... You can save strats for TI, but it's not going to be a, a, the identical patch yeah. whenever TI rolls around. Also, I don't think it's fair to the winning teams who played very well and outmaneuvered some of the more popular teams to say that, oh, they're already qualified for mm -hmm. TI. They don't care that much. I mean, they do care. They're at a major. There's no way you don't want to win a major and you don't try. We, we talked on the fluff panel uh, once again, like two series ago, about this concept of the nature of a competitor, of a competitive player. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these players enjoy the process a lot because if you didn't enjoy the process i mean it's hell it's hell mm -hmm. to be a tier two player for years grinding through the qualifiers getting knocked out it's hell to, to get to the point that these guys are at so you yeah. have to enjoy the process and i think to to assume that just because they're tier one players playing at events i mean it would be idiot it would make no sense to all of a sudden oh you stop you stop focusing on the process right how could that stop yeah. that's an integral part to somebody's humanity you know it's like that is what makes somebody them it's that, very much about the journey not the destination yeah and otherwise even, they couldn't make it here aui spoke on it on the we say things podcast with sunspan and cinderin that they actually felt happier that eg that won ti when secret lost as opposed to winning ti because secret was their rivals they were consistently going head to head against them and then once they win ti they're like oh okay i mean that's nice and seeing liquid i remember liquid winning ti I saw Matu afterwards, and he was just like, now what? What do I do now? Once I've already climbed the mountaintop, what more is there left? And so I haven't put too much credence into the theory that there's something to be said for saving strats, maybe like five levels of subconscious down. But here, T1 versus Quincy Crew, it's all on the line, and we have a draft already. Templar, Assassin, and Viper banned out by T1. Quincy Crew take out the Lion, Abaddon, and pick up an Enchantress. Quincy Crew has used this Viper, uh, abused this Viper, I should say, throughout the entire NADPC. They flex it between uh, Lullis and Quinn, and they bo both do this Boots of Travel build. They play around it really well, and I think TNC, uh, TNC as well as uh, T1 also play with this Viper a lot and did a lot in, in the SEA region with it. And all of a sudden, the Viper band goes up in value when they first phase a Dragon Knight. Yep. Yep, that completely completely dumpsters that hero, like in lane and in game. You just break them, and then all of that you know, tankiness everybody talks about just looks pathetic. And interestingly enough, when I was looking at T1's most successful heroes, Enchantress was the second or third in Season 2 of the SEA DPC. So it's nice that they snatched it away from them, but also secured something that they really like, which is strong lanes. These North American teams love to dominate their lanes, and they're very good at it. So I, I really hope that T1 drafts to win lanes as well, because every team that's gone up against Quincy Crew or Evil Geniuses so far at this major and didn't really think about their lanes right. had a hard time transitioning into the mid game. There's always like one game where they lose lanes to some NA team and it's like, okay, maybe, maybe we need to put a little bit more 
focus on the lanes. And I don't I don't think they need to draft necessarily to win the lanes, but more so to not get dumpstered. Yeah, not have losing lanes. That's pretty much yeah. it. Yeah. And also T1 have some of the most mechanically skilled players in all of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I think everyone on this team is a top 100 player. So it's pretty interesting to think that so long as they don't get monstered, they'll do, they'll do just fine. It's also worth mentioning that uh, top 100 players in pubs, like p the laning is probably the closest thing in pubs to a competitive environment because it's not, you know, five people that need to all communicate with each other. It's just two. Uh, if you're if you're in a side lane for the most part, and if you're mid, it's just a one v one. So mid's basically the same, and maybe you're communicating with like one position forward that's roaming or something along those lines. So it's very similar. It's probably the closest environment that you can get to like a competitive environment. So I, I imagine T1 will be very comfortable in laning because that's how many people climb and, and win pubs. Mm -hmm. uh, this Luna pick seems pretty standard so far. It feels like it's quickly becoming one of the most contested carry heroes this patch. She farms so fast, her laning is strong, she hits the mid-game timing with her team, she can fight, she can split push, she can do what you need, so she's like a very valuable hero. But like Aoi said a couple of times before, something she does lack is single target burst damage, so I would like to see that be corrected in Quincy Crew's draft. The same way they paired it up with a Doom on Nigma, you need to pair it with something that just is completely tunneled on a single target just so you can balance out Luna's AoE damage. Yeah, so there's not just some hero that's like, if you don't burst me, I win. And then you just don't have the burst for that hero. Yeah, it, it opens you up to to getting completely obliterated in the draft. You look at oh. T1. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Other roles have also been an issue. They ban out the Shadow Demon. I imagine Terrorblade's also going to be a ban out because Luna does have answers, but her pairings are just as important. Uh, like I was saying, you look at T1, they have Dragon Tail, which is an incredibly good single target stun with the damage of Mortimer's, so they won't have to worry about bursting a hero like Enchantress. And they have the... Uh, DK's a beefy frontlining melee guy that would really love to be tossed into people, so with the with the cookie, this is like a double uh, double combo. You have the, the, the ulti combo and then the laning combo as well. That's true, and he can also be gobbled up at some point and just thrown into the fray. Yeah, that's a that's like a super late item now, though, from what I'm yeah. seeing, just because the the nerfs. Like, you don't get that many levels on Snapfire, and it, it's dependent on the the ulti. But eventually, you eventually you will get it because it's just too good. So the Shadow Demon ban makes sense because you don't want to have a shadow, shadow Demon against your Luna because the offensive disruption is just so strong. And the Terror Blade ban to me is just he's also a very valuable carry this patch, but. Something that is notable is he can match Luna on all of her timings, and he can farm just as fast as her, given that he didn't have a very hard lane. And I think he'll win the late game too, because you just summon an illusion of Luna that's glaving her own team, which is very sad. That's very sad. Uh, and uh, of course, if she pops her ult on you, you just sunder her and then kill her in one hit, which also is very sad. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to ban out some 23 Savage signatures, Morphling? forced to be reckoned with in his hands. I think you just should because the guy's only spamming Morphling and Spec in pubs. His last like 40 games are 90% Morphling and Spectre and the guy's like ranked three. So of course he's going to be able to play other things, but We're, uh, that's an insane amount of practice. When when the, the great confluence happened and all of these regions showed up on European leaderboards, you know where 23 Savage? That's where he was, ranked he three. He was three? Yeah, he was one in, in Southeast Asia. Oh, for sure, yeah. And Abed was, it was between Abed and Quinn in uh, in in NA and RTZ was in there, but they were kind of flipping in and out. But it was 23 Savage, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, by the way, Tsunami, guess what? Jenkins was telling another pub story where, lo and behold, he was one and seventeen. Oh, this is true. With one of these Southeast Asian players, I don't know. Who was it? Who I don't know if I believe oh, this. Oh, okay, it was 23 Savage. It was. Was it? And he was on Spectre. He was on Spectre. Uh oh. Okay. You we can took see Quinn's going home alone on the screen now. We took two sets of racks, and I was one in seventeen on off lane. No, you weren't. And we threw. He was just like, just don't die. And I died right in front of the base, and we got thrown. <laughs> and he wasn't mean to me. So oh, shout out to him. He's so nice because I would have been shouting profanities at myself. <laughs> he his words were, please just don't die. And then I died. That was my 17th Condolences death. to him. No one anyway, deserves that. Yeah, this is his hero. I mean, this is this is the, the guy that he's spamming. Uh, Echo Saber build, looking really strong. 
uh, against Luna and Enchantress, these are both kind of squishy heroes. You have enough agility to hit the edge through the, uh, the the passive. And Luna, you just spawn Manta Illusions on her. It soaks up all of the uh, the Luna ult, and, and she's very easy to kill with the Scotty. I think this is, yep. other than TB, the carry to 1v1 the Luna. And something we were talking about earlier is how Quincy Cruz so far does not have that high single target damage. And Spectre's a very durable hero who does need a lot of single target damage to be taken down. So she's a good pick in that regard. Uh, I also like this Tidehunter pick a lot because I'm learning to look at this hero a little differently after LGD's series today. Yeah. They picked him just so he could tank the Dragon Toe and the Lion Stun. So this hero can soak up a lot of these single target disables because this meta seems to be about these like fast stuns on one target, killing them very quickly. And Tidehunter is a hero that fits in really That's well. That's true. That's a really good point. He does a really good job of just frontlining and tanking it, and then someone like Aluna can go ham in the fight. Even though he's insanely boring and has a super long cooldown, it's still like, yeah, that is that sounds invaluable so right what, now. What is the advantage that a Tidehunter has over, say, Mars, which is the most popular offlaner of the entire tournament? Uh, like I said, he's just very good at soaking up. Like, he'll, he will tank this single target burst that they're going for, okay. just so that someone on his team doesn't have to. And that's the way I'm starting to look at Tidehunter after LGD's series today, because he did a really good job at doing that for his box. Yeah. So being able to shake off those stuns, it's not so much about the Ravage, it's just having a meat shield. Yeah, exactly. No, that sounds totally right, because the thing is, like, a hero like Timber does the, uh, fulfills kind of the same role, but the DK stun is so long you will that die you will it. die on Timber. Mm -hmm. But if you can just dispel it, no, that sounds like, that sounds insanely good. I, I, it doesn't surprise me that Tide's win rate has been going up on... Uh, Dota 2 Pro Tracker and, and oh, other amazing. sources, and it makes sense yeah, with think, what you said. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot more of this Tidehunter throughout the Major, just because he fills that niche so well. It's and like the only hero that can do that. Who else can do that? And fighting so far in this meta just seems to be going in, all in on a target, disengaging, going back in. 100%, yeah. 100% so agree with that. I think we'll see a lot more of our Watermelon in the next oh, couple of days. Treant Protector, picked up by T1. Used to be a Chinese specialty in Season 2 DPC. Great lane partner. And it seems like T1 are very, very interested in protecting the Spectre. They ban out ET. They ban out Necro. They ban out a break from Hoodwink. And now Quincy Crew, meanwhile, they're targeting these lane winners. Ban out the Batrider. Ban out the Lina. Possible mid lane opponents against a Death Prophet, perhaps? Sue, I would like to make a prediction here. Please. I'm going to go ahead and predict that this will be a last pick Broodmother from Quincy Crew with a rotation of this. Tidehunter to be a position five with Enchantress four in the Broodmother lane. That is a hot take. Thank you. Uh, I will be Why? horribly wrong, uh, as usual. Why do it's you okay. think so? Uh, I think that's because they've ran the Tide five before. They mm. run the Enchantress uh, four a lot. They flex the Death Prophet as well. And I think it's a fairly it's a fairly free Broodmother game. Uh, I think you'll dumpster any any lane combination between these between these heroes. Bro, right. all these bands have been dedicated to protecting Spectre. They even take out the Undying, which I guess is also good against DK, as we saw earlier in the series with LGD. Maybe this is a stupid prediction because they. I like uh, it. They don't have last pick, but it does well. I could see it. <laughs> I could see it, but they're still lacking burst damage on the side of Quincy Crew. Maybe they just don't need it, and they're all in on these long fights. But it would be nice to see a correction for that. All right, I am an idiot. Uh, it's okay, Jenkins. That's almost a brood mother. It's very close. Because she's, <laughs> she's also... Mother of dragons. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Effie. really appreciate the I'm bailout. Here. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Do you have an equally spicy prediction for T1, Effie? Uh, not, not really. I, I, do? I, I don't have this okay, amazing, amazing creativity <laughs> Go for around the island over here, guys. I believe that they will be last picking a brood mother. <laughs> Shifting the DK to four <laughs> positions. Oh, of okay. Uh, yeah, it's like a micro a, hero. Like a brood mother because he is a mother to the forest. A tree father. Yes, of course. See, this is so interesting to me because we didn't see Nature's Prophet at all until yesterday when Noping played it. And then we saw it today when Evil Geniuses played it. They were like, hey, this actually looks good again. Yeah. And then they probably watched that series. And they said on T1, why don't we just play it too? So it's really cool to see the meta just change over the course of a few series. What's the incentive for the Nature's Prophet here? Are they looking to make space for the Spectre? Maybe rotate to DK's lane five minutes, 10 minutes, take a tower? 
I think he's just a very strong laner and has global presence and can keep lanes pushed out, which is going to be very valuable against Quincy Group. Have we seen him off lane this tournament? Because clearly they already have the Spectre for 23. No, we've only seen two safe lane here. And it was Care, RTZ, and HFN. So the, the off lane natures feels kind of bad. The, the, the issue with that hero in the offlane is that the TP cooldown is so long now, and as an offlaner, you want to be very active. And so the cooldown can actually cause you to not be able to show up to fights. And as a carry, it's no big deal. As an offlaner, it is a big deal. But with that being said, I think they want to avoid fights against this lineup. I agree. That's a lot of logic, but I just want to hear the biases. Effie, which team are you biased for? No, 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 no. You can't think about it. I want the... But here's the thing. I, I don't that, that, actually that, that, know how these teams look right now, so I can't be biased. Just ask me, Ask me after this game and I'll I'm give biased. you an answer. I'll tell you. Ask me after this game and I'll tell you okay, which fine. team I like more. I just need to see more of them, honestly. Imagine being analysts on an analyst panel. Let's send it to casters to cast this game number one. Take it away. Thank you, Tsunami. We got ourselves yet another SCA versus NA game, but unlike EG and TNC, these two teams are the only teams remaining in the tournament that we did not see in the group stage or the wild card. I'm here with OD Pixel. We haven't seen much from these guys yet. What do you think we're going to see in this game? I, I think we're going to get a lot of action, Brian. We're going to get a lot of action. And, and also sort of like the, the clash of two different approaches, as it seems to me. You know, from, from Quincy Crew, we very much have this group up and go. You know their five-man, their ability to run down lanes, to just brute force take fights. It's going to be rather strong in the mid-game. Whereas with, with, with T1, I'm seeing a lot of sort of split push, you know, play the map, protect towers, whilst 23 Savage becomes this big, badass carry to, to bring them through in the late game. I mean, <laughs> how do you think this is going to sort of you know, meet together? Together here between the two of them, Brian, and what do you like? Well, Quincy Crew, quite frankly, I don't think showed us what they're capable of in their first series against No Ping. We saw some glimpses of what they want to do, but they were just a tad bit sloppy. So today I'm looking for them to be clean with this early group up lineup that's going to snowball and early momentum in the laning phase. And then T1 on the other side kind of just stomped both of their games against Aster. So I don't feel like I got to see much of their mid to late game decision making at all. And this time they've got the Spectre against the Luna matchup. So it's going to be a battle of hold the door for T1. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I say, they've, they've got great means to do it. Cuckoo coming in with this profit to end the draft up. You know, he's going to be putting some insane map pressure on. Uh, and he's going to have backup to do it. You can imagine Carl, he gets an early mobility item online. He's going to be the man jumping in, leading the charge, starting the fights. White Mon wants he's got the six. He'll have that damage to, to ready add up into those plays that they'll look for across the map in that, that mid stage of it all. But well, we'll see how we get the lanes matching up. Of course, down on the bottom, 23 Savage. He's going to be laying into the Leslau Tide and the MSS Enchantress. We'll let the backup of Whitemon. I mean, for, for the Spectre, is this a happy place for 23 Savage against these two, or is he going to feel some pain against Quincy Crew? Yeah, it's not exactly a kill lane, but they do have a lot of constant harass. As you already see, they're spamming the spells to start, both going for the trade spell rather than potentially the enchant plus the gush. And that's an understanding that Spectre, you don't really have to worry about her killing you, but she's also tanky herself. So wear and tear is the name of the game. And meanwhile, of course, over on the top half of the map, Cuckoo and Zephyr putting the pressure onto your wild Luna. We'll let the back of Veloa here on his wyvern. Uh, what do you make of this one in comparison? You know, how, how hard is the early game here for Luna? Yeah, it looks like they're cutting down all the trees, but he's giving them the body, <laughs> the tree and protector. They, I, it looked like in, on paper it'd be an easy lane, but melee hero plus nature's profit. Uh, I, as a carry player, that's one of my worst nightmares when I think of a lane. Oh, for sure, yeah. Just having something right in your face, and Kuka being able to offer in the punches, and, and we see here uh, you are. How they're doing on the region and lane. They have got plenty of it. You've seen Eloy's come to lane with five tangos and a sow. So he's going to have all the means to keep your war nicely topped up in that top lane. And of course, whilst this is all going on in the mid matchup right now, seven for three on Carl. Quinn was seeing six for zero. So Carl just having that extra edge of the, the melee hitter here to, to get a few denies in against Quinn. Just Quinn doing his best to, to really exercise the pressure onto this DK. Carl has got the regen, but Quinn doing as, as much as he can to really just shove the lane and uh, get, get it pushed underneath Carl's tower. Yeah, I feel like the entire meta is now getting shaped by DK. Uh, mid laners such as Death Prophet weren't seeing much play 
earlier on in this tournament, but because you need a hero that matches or even bullies the DK away from this tower pressure, Death Prophet's a perfect example of such, and because the popular heroes always shape the meta, I expect to be seeing, seeing even more of this hero moving forward. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and in this matchup as well, when, when you see these two mids, I imagine it's going to be incredibly static because, you know, as expected, once the six is there, both are going to be eyeing up that uh, opportunity for an early tier one tower. I mean, who, who does have the sort of the bigger tier one tower potential out of those? Does actually be what top lane you are? It's going to be all right here. It will only just though. We'll have the, the sound passed over. But yeah, mid wise, you know, who can put on the more the most pressure the soonest out of these two? I think these guys are kind of at a stalemate in terms of no one can bully the other away single-handedly. So it's going to be come down to the early rotations. You have the Nature's Prophet yeah. offlane, one of the few cores that doesn't mind being in a different lane early on because he can just TP right back to his own respective lane. But the Enchantress, it, it, it's all all in on the towers for Quincy Crew because they're dealing with the Triumph Protector. You can't afford to let him living armor those up. But for Carl, I'm expecting maybe two DK forms to add up to take down uh, the mid, mid tower for Quincy Crew. No, for sure, for sure. And we, we see so far, you know, that the two carries, it is at the moment, you are definitely having the, the slightly tougher time. A 10 for two as opposed to the 16 and three that Savage has been able to get out of the bottom lane. Farm for the off lane is very equal though. Lesla and Cuckoo having just a, as equal farm out of the lane. It's just that mid lane really where we're seeing the, the biggest difference. And Carl just continuing to, to keep himself about a full wave of CS ahead of Quinn with a fair few denies thrown in there as well. Yeah, purely based on the CS so far, I think Quincy Crew is not exactly going to be content in the near future. Maybe three, four minutes from now, they're going to have to ramp up the pace of this game because Spectre, if given the time, will reign the queen of the late game. Yeah, I mean, that's in any game like this, you know, if 22 Savage just continue to get away with a good opening, solid mid game, what is actually going to be there to threaten him later on? Like, like what are the sort of the things that he's going to have to play around in the later stages? Or is there just not really much at all? Is this a pretty good looking Spectre game overall, even though the Spectre obviously was shown a little earlier in the draft? I think it's just going to be the only, the, the cooldown is what they're going to be able to punish. The fact that, yes, you have low cooldown heroes like the Nature's Prophet, but I think Quincy Crew can maybe even stagger their ultimate usage such that they can force out haunts and then look to take objectives. So rather than maybe countering the Spectre directly late game, because I don't think they have that, they can look to hit specific windows of weakness with the Spectre. Well, I mean, and, and doing that though, I definitely feel like it's not going to be too easy. Was he bottom lane trying to get aggressive in onto White Mark? I've got the center underneath the tower. I'll chase him down. They'll get the first blood here. MSS and Lesla getting themselves a kill out of this bottom lane. As getting Savage isn't easy. Top lane at the same time. You are continuing to just be bullied away, ready from hitting the creeps here as Cuckoo continues to send the trains in upon him as they try and mess with the pull here. Top. Just what I've been waiting for. Yeah, if uh, you guys haven't been watching too much of the tournament and you're curious as to why this Enchantress is getting picked up first pick, that is exactly why. We just got done seeing MSS pressure the mid lane. Didn't quite get in position with the Centaur, but you saw the threat that he was putting on the DK and immediately rotating to the bottom to get a kill on the support. And as long as he's missing in the enemy jungle, he's got all the ward vision that he needs. He can be a threat on both these lanes at once and it just changes the way everyone has to play and he has complete like nobody wants to be here none of the supports can contest him directly quinn might be able to pop exorcism but let's see what? and they're gonna have a bit of an attempt here carl he's gonna pop the dragon form immediately tp's away as soon as the exorcism comes out same for white Mark. they don't want to deal with quinn whilst the ult's up he's gonna swing over towards the mid on the dp but zephyr's here to help try and push quinn away he's not having a lot of luck with it though because the damage between the two of them here it's gonna be one more hit, can he quite get it out of the way? He can't. And Zephyr back into the trees. Zephyr will be able to sneak away and does manage to survive. So all things said and done there. T1 able to, to very much limit what Quinn's able to do here with this exorcism as they, they manage to successfully disengage. And Quinn, he's rather low. White Mont won't find him. And of course, yeah, with the skill build, does indeed have the, the points of the shredder. Nothing in the blast, so it doesn't have the nuke damage to threaten Quinn. Still though, Quinn's going to have to back off and... Yeah, first round of the exorcism. Nothing's going to be happening. The kill is there down bottom as Leslau and MSS. I mean, again, MSS here on this charge is definitely putting that extra pressure in onto this bottom lane. Those first two kills both going down to, to his involvement. 
Yeah, as long as you're full health on the offlaner against the Spectre, you're going to be able to be aggressive with virtually no items, especially when you have an Enchantress. I think Lesla has learned very well from the mistakes of other people this tournament that you go that early ring of health, you sustain up, 23 Savage constantly being pressured. I think that's a sum of multiple points of pressure that all added up into that one death. Absolutely. And uh, you know, now with the level 6, as you say, that ring, it's very hard to pressure Lesla out of laying the... Brought Zephyr Downer as well. See if they are able to make anything happen. I mean, if they do, Lesla, I guess, yeah, not quite having the mana to threaten a Ravage. Well, the three heroes down, I mean, can they, can they do anything about the tide? They're looking for it. They're going to start having a bit of a poke. And it's hard. He's, he's pretty tanky. Look, get him in the trees and okay, there we have it. That was what was missing. The extra bit of damage boost here from Cuckoo. As Cuckoo's able to throw in a Nature's Wrath, and that will get the job done. It's T1 are able to bring together the damage to get Lesla out the lane and get 23 Savage a bit more space down here. Yeah, I think Nature's Prophet helps round off the draft for T1, but you see here, LOA, he's perfectly content being underneath tower, soaking up the XP and also clearing the trees, getting himself a decent amount of farm, and this is what they have to do on T1. You cannot allow the opponent five position to relieve that much pressure, but Quincy Crew in return, MSS already rotating the mid, the Wildkin, Creep giving the aura to their other creeps, and they should be able to get a trade here. Doesn't seem like T1 wants to respond. No, this is a... Uh, it seems like a very early sort of tier one tower to just let go. You know, you don't usually see teams sort of just concede their tier one as freely, freely as is, is being done so by T1 in this situation. But yeah, indeed, the, the mid tower taken out there. Big objective for Quincy Crew, bottom lane. T1, they've got their focus on trying to take Lesla out again. This time round, LOA comes in with the backup. And Sav well, 23 Savage is going to go for the TP unless now it doesn't have vision, so it won't know for the Ravage. As 23 Savage is able to reset himself over towards the mid lane, look for the farm. We've got Quinn and MSS wrapping around top. They're on the hump for Cuckoo here. They do have the ensnare from, from the Dark Troll Summoner to, to help trap him. So Cuckoo will do his best job to escape. And they should have the man here. I don't think he's going to have too many options for a TP out. And he doesn't indeed. He tries for a TP. But with the ensnare there from MSS, there's no escape for Cuckoo. Yeah, I can't tell if that was a miss micro or just a sick courier foresight by MSS to fly that over the sprout for the vision to use the troll net. That was pretty sick. I'm going to assume it was the latter just because I do have respect for him as a as a highly skilled player. Was, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's the little things where isn't he busy microing the creep? I would be. No, that's, yeah, that's some big brain stuff there from MSS Just for sure. Absolutely, very impressive stuff here. As uh, it's showing on his KDA, 2-0-1 MSS causing a lot of havoc. And we'll catch him here with a TP. He's going to do his best to, to escape this. He's able to get the slow off on Carl. Got the dagger coming in. I mean, MSS, he's just making the space here. He's got uh, pretty much three cores looking towards him. We'll go for the TP out. Carl will be able to put a stop to it as MSS will get burnt to a crisp here by Carl with the breathing fire as they finally get rid of that Enchantress that's been causing so many issues across the map for T1. And bottom tower now. They are busy top, as you said, space made. A lot of times we'd be memeing about that, but yeah. that's the whole idea of space. Distraction on the opposite side of the map, and this is against a Triumph Protector who is elected to not put a single point in living armor. I was under the impression the point of his hero was to slow down the Death Prophet Luna momentum, but he's mainly going for the wave clear and laning presence of the Leech Seed. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, we'll see if he does you know, just Zephyr continues to max out those two, two skills, or if he does fancy to take a point, but... I mean, even, maybe, maybe they just feel that they just... Against this push of Quincy Crew, these towers are going to go down nevertheless, so... Uh, yeah, and they, they certainly are. You already have seen these two Tier 1 towers taken away. You know, T1, they're not too far behind, though, on the objectives. Of course, top tower's been taken. The mid tower sitting rather low, so Carl's able to get another push through. Uh, once the Elder Dragonfawn's back up, he should be able to secure that mid tower. 1300 dagger towards the blink on the DK. See over on the side of Quincy Crew. Quinn very close to having his Yule's Scepter complete. It's T1. They have got the six on White Mom. So they do have that, that damage potential to be able to burst some of these heroes. So it will become rather tanky later on. On the network, we see farming away quite happily. Yawa up there. I mean, all three cores of Quincy Crew currently sitting in that top spot. 
As uh, definitely still a bit of a catch up game that T1's got to pull together. You know, Quincy Crew, 3k lead at the moment, 12 minutes in. Uh, but at the same time, I guess this is the sort of lead that Quincy Crew's lineup kind of needs to secure up because they do want to play a little bit faster. Yeah, absolutely. As it's basically four protect one where Luna is supposed to hit this ridiculously absurd timing around 20 minutes where she's going to have two full items because she farms so fast. And if you think about the playmaking potential for T1, it's just not straightforward until the DK blink. And even then, you're going to have MSS Enchantress on your side of the map that you are most likely going to have to avoid somehow when you're smoking, as well as the Leslaw Tidehunter. It's just really difficult as long as Quincy Crew remains positioned properly on the map for them to get the target they're going for. Smoke up from Quincy Crew. It's Quinn. And oh wait, they're on the hunt for one of these cores. They're going to go for Carl. They're going to try. Leading in onto the DK. They've got the Siphon going. Lesnar's coming in with a slow of the gush. Carl, he's not got any way out of this one as the force around him. Carl taken out in the mid as Quincy Crew catch him out and uh, continue to be able to push back that blink dagger timing here on the DK. Yeah, this is the Quincy Crew I wanted to see the other day. How they. Are this this is the game plan that they have perfected over the course of many years. Usually Yawar's on either some hard farming carry, or he's on the likes of a Drow or a Luna, where they're not aiming to go for very much longer with this farming period of the game, but they're happy to just make these little kill plays, grouping up temporarily, but they're not expending any ultimates, and they're gonna go back to playing the efficiency game in little duos of bit. pressure, as you're seeing here. Ah, MSS and Quinn, they're able to catch out Cuckoo. They really are just continuing to, to take anything. You've got to be so careful if you're T1 playing against Quincy Crew. Any sort of slip-ups and they are immediately on top of you. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna know when this is ending based on Yawar's queued up items here. He's not going for the full manta. At least he doesn't plan to as of yet. He has the Yasha then BKB planned out. So that I would guesstimate that is about the 20 minute mark that he'll get both of those items. That, that'll that most likely be a smoke into a Roche with the next Death Prophet ultimate into an Aegis that takes all the outer tier towers, maybe a lane of Rax. That's the game plan that Quincy Crew, if they will be content if that is what the pace of the game looks like in the near next six minutes. I do, do like the attempts there from Cuckoo to try and disrupt uh, Yuar's farming. We did see he's, he, he was leaving sort of the tree and scattered around the camps, trying to block some of the spawns and was able to take away sort of round the triangle there from Yuar. So Cuckoo trying his best to, to slow that farm down. You see the jump it. To reveal themselves onto MSS. Damage at the kisses. They will be able to take him out. So T1 get the, the kill, but again, you know, MSS. Definitely not the highest of priorities. As much as an issue he was causing them, it, it isn't one of those big old cores. You know, T1, ideally, they want to find more than just an Enchantress. Yeah, he did block the Ancients there with a tree, and so even though they did position perfectly on the map from Quincy Crew, as we talked about, that's why NA loves our Enchantresses and Abaddons, because while we're farming, we need, that, we need that support to tank the gank for us, and they did that properly, but that gank is tanked so that Yoar can farm the Ancients from the 15 to 16 minute mark. All the big camp as well as the Ancients were blocked, so I think this is going to make them feel the need to, hey, we got nothing else better to do, let's go now rather than later. And uh, the yeah. Roche map control part is going to be a bit earlier than I expected, and that means that the BKB is going to be as a result of the lead that they gained during the Aegis farming period. They go for a steal at T1. They've got their eyes on it. 23 Savage is ready to head in. Okay, he decides against it at the last moment there. Doesn't want to th throw away his life at a, a chance of, of going for the steal. It's Quincy Crew. They get the space. They want the kill. Yuwa's going to be able to pick up the Aegis. DD rune as well. Quinn's just going to take it here for a quick bottle refill. Quincy Crew continue to amp up this, this expected group up and go that they've drafted for. Yeah. Although 3k, you know, that, that 3k's been there for a while. You know, T1, they are keeping themselves at a steady pace behind. They're, they're not sleeping, slipping any further uh, behind that of Quincy Cruz. White Mom will get caught out, but 23 Savage cleaning up these Ancients. He is closing the gap on the Spectre, and if T1 can sort of weather through a few fights against Quincy Crew, get themselves on top of an opportunity, there's still absolutely a, a world where this Spectre becomes a big sort of late-game terror here for Quincy Crew. 
Yeah, sometimes we talk about how many fights a team needs to come back into the game. I think this is a game yep. where they only need one fight, but it is going to be incredibly difficult to get that one fight because they have severe damage issues on the side of T1. If you look at their cores, they have Spectre, DK, Nature's Prophet, none of which are super well known for doing damage. And then Quincy Crew has double healing supports and three super tanky cores once the Luna gets that BKB. So I'm not too optimistic for their chances here, but if they can catch Quincy Crew a little off guard, that will blow this game wide open for them. Oh, savage there, living on the... Yeah, right on the edge there as he walked down that lane. Not quite able to get the grab on him though, Quincy Cruz. 23 Savage does keep to the side. Yeah, Quincy Cruz just completely grouped up around this area. T1 have to be very careful how they approach and how they sort of step out on the map. Carl just trying to find himself some space up top, building the BKB neck. Starts to blink. Savage, of course, still just working on that, that Mantra after the Echo Saber. He's got a bit of means to, to get out against some of this control, some of these silences that they're going to be able to throw out upon him in the action. Yeah, I really like the plan that Quincy Crew had coming into this draft. It's just so hard for DK to ever want to blink stun any of these cores, especially the supports even. As nice jewels by Quinn. Cuckoo, no way out of this. Another catch for Quincy Crew. And you are as well. I mean, he's just doing it on his own. He's doing it on his own. He doesn't need any backup down here. I mean, they are just picking up the kills left, right, and center now. Very careful this is moves proof. here from Quincy Crew. Yeah, this is proof that the NA playstyle works on the international stage. Like, for me, I'm watching this game, and this is exactly how I know these guys love to play. And the Aegis allows Yoar on a hero that's not traditionally independent to make plays like that, where if he waits on that hill and he sees two or three heroes, he's not all that concerned because his team will be able to connect to him by the time he has a second life in a fight that he would be fine to take. And now that lead is extending, and that's what this first Aegis is all about. Two minutes left. Yeah, I mean, as you say, just the, the ability to be as split up as they are across the map here, Quincy Crew. And he's uh, definitely showing with the space and farm that they're able to clean up without T1 apparently being able to do too much about it. We'll see down bottom, Carl. He's on the retreat here, you are. He's going to run him down a little bit. Carl's got the backup. And so does you are. Quinn and LOA both in the neighborhood. If a fight kicks off, Exorcism and Winter's Curse ready to go. I don't have the, the Eclipse, but of course, even without that, the other spells alone should be enough to get some of these kills. Even the DK, if the car steps too far forward. But Carl, he's out of it. Doesn't want to get involved place. in the action that the Quincy Crew are bringing. And Zephyr trying to slow down the action down bottom. Yeah, this is a really cool move. As you see, DK, you see the mode that T1 is in. DK's even ulting just to clear creep waves with that level 12 splash damage. Nice blink from Carl and Treant Protector. His, he would not clear that wave quick enough. Quincy Crew looking to force down objectives. You see the pipe on the tide, the BKB from both of the other two cores. They want to ram it down a lane, and that uh, just dragging the creeps to the side is such a high level play because if he doesn't do that, that's almost guaranteed to be a tier two down. Oh, Cuckoo. I found him, Quinn, coming in, leading the way after they come through with the smoke as Cuckoo has no saving him. Quincy Crew, what do they want to look for next? Still a tier one tower sitting on the top lane. 22 Savage has been pushing out this half of the map, though, so hard to really get things together for a full on push. And yeah, as we're seeing, you, know, you mentioned Zephyr, and outside of that, you have heroes like Cuckoo and and here's like 23 Savage, they're going to constantly be, be farming aggressively along these lanes. They're, they've got multiple ways to continue to cut creep waves and just mess with, with any sort of opportunity that Quincy Crew will look towards to utilize their lead that they currently sit at. And we are seeing that, you know, 21 minutes in, the 4K lead, I mean, it was 3K about 10 minutes ago. It's barely changed because of how much T1 is doing to just try and slow down Quincy Crew as much as they can without ever really showing their faces directly in front of Quincy Crew's lineup. Yeah, we saw a TNC win many a games playing the split push as play style that I'm yeah. seeing similar out of T1. And we haven't had to see them play this yet as they had commanding leads in both of their two games so far in the major, but this is really good stall by them. They did not get what they wanted out of this Aegis on the side of Quincy Crew. They extended their lead slightly, but not a single tower, at least that I can tell, was taken 
during that time. And the, the, I mean, the Spectre, he's got Manta, Echo Saber already. And more and more items. Once he gets to that Scotty, you have two ranged cores that both rely on the healing from their supports. It's going to be crucial. Bottom lane, Cuckoo. They won't get the tower. We're going to see the Horn come out. As this time around, T1, they're ready to fight. The little one's lower. Lower is going to be able to hold back the Spectre momentarily here with the Windsor's Curse, but he's still going to go down. They'll find him down on the bottom lane. Cuckoo in return will fall as he has no route of escape. But a bit of a punch back there from T1. Sure, it's just a support for a core, but it, a trade is a trade. Uh, and uh, again, as you say, T1 very much bringing out that the very smart approach to how to deal with exactly what Quincy Crew is trying to do. I mean, I guess the question is now, Brian, for, for Quincy Crew, when when you sort of feel that the way that T1's playing against you, and, uh, what, what do you do? Do you have to amp it up? Is there certain items they have to work towards to make sure that their push is going to come in at a, a pace that the split push isn't going to be able to contest? Like, what, what do you do against a team that's playing this smart against you? So it's potential that they win a little bit too hard on the team fight items because when you go team fight items that's under the assumption that you're going to be able to force the fight you want so items like this blink on leslau are the start to you have to be able to start picking people off and forcing them to engage on you oh look at this bottom they're gonna get the jump in leslau's gonna put the ravage but why for the side he's got the kisses coming in quinn gonna put the bkb get out of the side keep himself healed up with the siphon carl turns his attention over towards leslau they bring down the tie Tide will fall and T1, they're ready for more. The cookie in, Carl jumps in over onto the LOA. LOA's gone. MSS, Jawan, and Quinn, they've got to back away. They're in onto Quinn. Quinn's going to turn with the Yules to hold back the DK. He's going to try for the TP out. They've got enough damage. They do. That's Quinn gone. It's T1. Their patience and, and their approach has got, it's just got this game to the point where I don't think Quincy Crews as far ahead as, as they kind of needed to be with this, this five man push and go. This. You know, losing three heroes like that, T1 losing nothing in return, that is the sort of fight that when, you know, T1's the team with the Spectre, y you're probably feeling a little concerned if you're Quincy Crew. Yeah, if there were seven Deadly Sins in Dota, I believe one of them would be showing your carry on top tier two and the rest of your team on bottom tier two, especially against a lineup with global presence from the Spectre as well as the Nature's Prophet. TNC sees this and s shuts that down immediately. Collapse on the bottom lane with five heroes ASAP. They get the superior numbers, force out the Ravage. Quinn didn't even want to use his exorcism there. And suddenly, things are looking real dire for the dire. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, 23 Savage, yeah, he, he's gearing up. He's still a little bit behind that of the farm of Yawa. Catching up as a, as a whole, as a unit hits, it's absolutely being done. T1 leveling the, the board now in terms of net worth difference. We'll see there again this this last fight. I mean, they're, they're amping themselves up, they're hyping themselves up, and understandably so. This is just some very smartly calculated Dota here from T1 in response to what Quincy Crew is trying to do. Again, Cuckoo even having a bit of a giggle there. As, uh, well, there we have it. Certainly feeling in, in the moment here, T1. And to see themselves in such a happy place here. And I, I think they know, they know that this 23 Savage Spectre is going to be going to a pretty nice place here with the last few fights they've made. Quincy Crew, they're coming in with a smoke. Another bad fight here from Quincy Crew. It, it, it is really, really going to hurt them. Quincy Crew's got to get something done here. Yeah, it looks like there was just this period of peace where Quincy Crew was content farming, but you can see how like the nature of the pins and needles that they were operating on, because the one time yeah. they break formation, T1 shut, like just punishes it so hard. It, it, you're just waiting for them to eventually capitalize. And because of this lack loss of momentum, Quincy Crew is going to rely on that second Aegis. And I believe that is going to be their last chance to really close out this game and the timing that they need. They won't be able to end it most likely, but if they can get one or two lanes of racks that will kind of mitigate the split push pressure that the Nature's Prophet's putting on that's constantly forcing them to split up, which is allowing them to also get the superior numbers in these engagements from Tier 1, T1. 15 seconds and yeah, Roche back up. So Quincy Crew, they'll set up for this one. You can definitely expect T1 will probably want to have something to say about it. 20 seconds until Horns back up for Savage. Bottom lane, Carl getting away with this tier two. Very close, really. I mean, about two thirds of the way, pretty much, towards the Aghanim Scepter after the Link BKB. So he is also going to be quite the threat in the team fight. We're going to start off the Roche now. Has been scanned out by T1. 
See if Team One can do anything about it. Cuckoo's gonna come in to try and get some vision, but immediately Lesnar's in with the blink over towards him. Cuckoo goes for the BKB and the TP out. But the curse is there. LOA able to put the den to the TP escape from Cuckoo. They will run him down. I mean, uh, this is a kind of a kind of space away from Roche here. They pop the Ravage. Zephyr gets caught. Your wife's going to come in with the BKB in the Eclipse. 23 Savage jumping around the team fight, but he's coming to the Eclipse. He's got to back off. Taking heavy damage here from the ultimate of your war. You've got the Yours Control. Savage is going to end up dying. As this ends up a complete catastrophe here for T1. Now, what starts was sort of Cuckoo just trying to check out the pit. He could have got out with the BKB, but I guess yeah, they, they felt they did have to try and fight. They didn't want to just lose Cuckoo like that. But 23 Savage committing him without Horde, that hurts big time. It's Quincy Crew, they're, they're back on track. A solid team fight win. The Roshan will be theirs. This is exactly what they needed to try and regain that momentum that they were starting to lose control of. Yeah, I thought Cuckoo was just going to force out some ultimates, be willing to sacrifice a BKB charge and a buyback just because Nature's Prophet's so good at rejoining the fight. And he, I think after he died, he realized, wait a minute, that's just an exorcism death prophet. <laughs> I do not want to buy back into that. But then T1 decided to commit anyways. I have to believe there's a little bit of miscommunication there. That's the nature of this game. If T1 catches them out of position, Quincy Crew is going to lose all the momentum. However, if they try to fight into Quincy Crew and take the wrong fight, that's what it's going to look like. Oh, for sure. I mean, and now, yeah, looking at some of the items coming up, Yawa is probably going to want to get his Scardy done before they do go for, for the next push with this Aegis. Over on the mid, there's now. He's stepping right up here for the creeps. He's feeling confident. And uh, Whitemon, Carl, Zephyr, and Cuckoo, they'll have something to say about this one. Uh, he's very, very tanky, Lesnar, with the plate mail and the pipe of inside. Is he going to be tanky enough to buy enough time for the rest of the team to come over there? Heading in, but Lesnar will go down. As now, Carl, he's ready to try and look for more. He's over towards LOA. Sentry has been dropped. This glimmer, and uh, well, his attempted escape is not going to save him whatsoever. As LOA will get left behind, we won't see Quincy Crew throw any more lives away in an attempt to, to turn this around. As uh, T1 able to punch back after. Uh, it's just some very over uh, confident posturing there from Leslau as he sort of steps up to, to the radiant high ground on the mid lane. Yeah, if there's such thing as bluffing in Dota, that's what Leslau was doing there. His whole team was missing, and he says, well, they could all be behind me. T1 doesn't know that, and just assumes that T1 won't have the audacity to go on him, but that's a ravageless tide. Even if his entire team was behind them, they could just walk away if they saw the reinforcements. So really good patience by T1 to not overcommit, waiting for Tide to be low enough that they could. And you just gotta be careful. I like that kind of play. It's a very SA-esque play style from, from Leslau, but it can get punished if the opponent calls you on it. Absolutely, yeah, T1 not gonna let that one pass in front of them whatsoever. I sees the opportunity completely. And so again, starting to, to swing the, the, the game flow back in their favor. Still a, a lead here for Quincy Crew, but not quite as big as it was once they took that rush. Quincy Crew, they're out with the smoke. They want to make something happen. Your has got the Scardi done. Of course, still a good couple of minutes left on the ages. Quincy Crew, who can they find? Savage. Start moving over towards the triangle, but as soon as he catches wind of Quincy Crew's presence, he will be, do his best to, to not get caught, not get involved. He has to step back. Leslau ready to threaten with the Ravage as well. It's Carl. Carl will show mid. Now, can they come out onto this DK? Oh, they're going to quite be able to get the grab there. Carl is out with the blink before they can get any damage instances upon him. They do have the catapult, though. That it, Nature's Prophet ulti would normally clear the creep wave, but that's going to be enough to get the back door lowered. So we're very cautious because you see it. Savage immediately heading over to grab the next creep wave. Uh, he's going to miss one of them though. This one will still pass through. That's a clutch fortification, clearing the catapult. They should be able to clear this one creep if they have to. It may be good enough for Quincy Crew to get the tier two, but you're dealing with living armor, and even if you get that tier two, you're not getting this tier three in lane of racks from this. I still just need yeah, these little things from T1. Slowing down each and every move from Quincy Crew to the maximum. Yeah, it's so important. Every time they do these things, the tree and protector bottom, the cutting of the creep wave by 23 Savage there. It's an extra 30 seconds. Creep waves spawn every 30 seconds. And every time you do this maneuver, just buying more and more time. And that's exactly what their lineup needs. 
excellent evasive maneuvers by T1. They had that one poorly chosen fight, but aside from that, I, I can't really point out any mistakes that they've made, and they're still down by 4K, so that speaks to the early presence of Quincy Crew's lineup, and this is a game where when Quincy Crew's up by about 5K at this point, I would consider it dead even. Absolutely, yeah, no, no doubt about it. And I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, if anything, you know, it just sort of makes you ask more questions what actually did happen in that moment when that mistake was made around the Roche bit. You know? As you say, you would probably put that down to some sort of miscommunication, you reckon? Yeah, usually they talk about how they would take the fight, and then they're not sure if they could take the fight. And then it looks like they're going to take the fight. And then two different people have a different interpretation of whether or not they're supposed to take the fight. It's a pretty hard occurrence to avoid happening. And the T1, relatively 23 Savage, newer to the team, could just be something that over time will be hashed out. But either way, the overall macro gameplay of the team, they clearly are on the same page. They're building the right items. Nature's Prophet going for the BKB AC. You can tell that they're itemizing to eventually be able to five man against Quincy Crew. Yeah, no, they really are. But again, you know, that whole sort of last minute of play, you know, Zephyr just being on that top half of the map in the trees. You saw, you know, the whole five mana Quincy Crew sticking together, having to go for him. It's just constantly sort of space created by T1. A lot of time wasted. And the Quincy Crew is you know, furiously struggling to deal with. They want to get action. They're going to look for Cuckoo. The BKB is going to go for the TP out. As, uh, I mean, I can the I guess, wait, did they cut the, what, he didn't have vision for the curse, or what happened there? Yeah, I have to assume he was trying to walk into the trees. I think, does he have the shard I on guess Nature's Prophet? Oh, he does not. I, I don't know what happened. They cut a tree and somehow couldn't see him, because he would have 100% cursed uh, yeah, for uh, core Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, it, it looked like a surefire curse, but yeah, not, not happening. I guess, yeah, it must have, must have not had the vision, as you say. Must have been just they know the he has no BKB. Let's see if they can uh, get him here. They probably will. As uh, Cuckoo, is he going to have any backup? No, they'll let him fall. So they might not have got him bot, but this works out just the better for them anyway. They get the kill and not needing to, to utilize the ult of the curse. As we see in this replay, I, I, they happen to cut the one tree that nobody was in the line of sight to was be able to utilize. Was that actually what it was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. They, I feel like they covered every <laughs> other tree. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well. As I say, yeah, all things happen for a reason, and yeah, they got the kill at the end of the day. They didn't even need the curse up top, so. It works out in some sense here for, for Quincy Crew, but of course for T1, you know, they'll tell you that that's just more time and more space, taking a little longer for these little kills. As Quincy Crew, they're, they're constantly sort of sweeping around at this five man, but we're just not seeing them get anywhere close to the base of T1 still. It, it, it's so hard for them to actually set up for these moves as T1 just continue to stall out to, to perfection, really, here. Yeah, they just have amazing sideline heroes with the Tree and Protector as well as the Nature's Prophet. And even the DK with the Ag's free pathing can pop his ultimate to clear a lot of creep waves. And they can't afford to separate on Quincy Crew. We saw what happened when they did that before. Oh. So they're just not able to push out the lanes nearly as efficiently as T1. And even though they got the kill on Cuckoo, because they missed the opportunity in the river, which was pretty close to a maybe desired objective in the tier two bottom, they were on their own side of the map. So they spin the entire death timer of Cuckoo fixing their lanes to get back to the other side. I mean, it, it just feels... It's, it's like, what, what do you do if you're Quincy Crew? They're, they're trying to do so much, and T1's just not letting it happen. We might see them bump into each other here. They're going to get the jump on a 23 Savage, but Misa D. Savage, he's out with the Horn. He's off to the side. They can't quite find him. White Mon started to kick him with the kisses. Carl jumps in, gets straight Retarded. on top of the wife, and that's going to be LOA gone. Now looking over towards MSS. They get the catch on a Cuckoo at the side, but Cuckoo will try with the TP out, won't make it. The physical damage is there. Now bring Cuckoo down. Carl, Savage, Zephyr looking towards Leslau. Leslau going to pop the Ravage. Carl and 23 already out to the side. They'll find themselves a second here, Quincy Crew. Can they get anything more than Carl? Even has a bit of a look back in here with the Dragon Tail onto Quinn. And knows that these three, they don't quite have the damage to take him down. So Quincy Crew, they get two kills. Exorcism is how we're going to come to an end, though. So it, it's going to be another sort of situation. They got the kills. What can they do objective-wise? In terms of fighting, it's, it's still going on. Zephyr and Carl, they're going to jump onto MSS on the back lines. 23 Savage, he's ready to go again. He's moving in onto the Enchantress. Shabwa, 
gonna do his best to try and push 23 Savage away, committing as the Luna onto this Spectre. They'll force 23 Savage out of the side. 23 Savage is able to break out. Zephyr using the overgrowth. I mean, it, it just seems like constant distraction. As the bottom lane creeps, they're pushing in. Quincy Crew, they will be able to pick up another kill onto Zephyr, but that time they spent trying to kill Zephyr, it, it's given time for Whitemon and pretty much Cuckoo to get back in the game. So kills are had, but still objectives, they're not being taken. Yeah, their primary source of catch is the slows coming out from Leslau. He, I would like to call him Les Teasy for that last blink onto the cliff there that he sat around watching his team chase after people and maybe they were able to get a core if he hadn't done that. So a little bit unfortunate, stuff happens, but give him a little tip, friendly tip from the teammates says they're all going to laugh it off. You know, it's just a major. It's going to be fine. They were looking towards the next Roche. He's going to be spawning. They know up oh, right now. Take it down nice and quickly here with Uwa's build. Butterfly Scardi, he's got the damage to boot. Or well, CT1, they are going to set up to, to try and contest it. They have struggled the last few times. See Quincy Crow actually stepping outside of the... the uh, as Carl, he's going to jump straight in onto Quinn. They're going to commit immediately onto the Death Prophet, Quinn. Be able to get the Yulzovs. Does still have a BKB and a cheese here, Quinn. BKB holds his ground, pops the BKB. Exorcism back up in 15 seconds. He's dead. They brought down Savage. That's the Spectre out and down. 23 Savage without the buyback. This is a hard fight now for T1. Quincy Crew, can they get more out of this? Five versus four. They have to be There's careful. The they don't it's know been the Spectre. Sprouted and now buyback. back. That's the LOA getting jumped on the back lines here by White Mon and Carl. They won't have enough damage to commit upon him. White Mon, he's going to go for the Invis TP out, but they've found. Dust is out. They have the Yules ready to go. So they'll cancel the escape of White Mon. Take out the Snapfire. With those two kills, Quincy Crew, they'll have the power to head back into the Roshan pit. Should be able to finish this uninterrupted by the other members of T1. And there's a refresher shard in there. Assuming that's going to go to Les Teasy as he double ravaged one of the scariest late game. They're already having a tough time on the side of T1 fighting into the clump of Quincy Crew. They're doing a great job anytime the Haunt comes out of just doing the buddy-buddy system to make sure that none of them get picked off. They even were able to focus the Wyvern as LOA finds him, bottom. Uh, Cuckoo still got the BKB TP and with the curse already used, they've not got anything else to stop it. So Cuckoo, he'll manage to make the escape. Maybe a bit of impatience. He wasn't TPing yet on the Nature's Prophet. Could have maybe held that a bit longer. Radiance oh, that's all right now. I see the, the Shadow Blade being well, picked up escape. by Cuckoo. I mean, that's always the dream for the carries, isn't it? Right? If you're an AG range carry and you get an illusionist cape, my goodness, the you know, stonks are only going to go up now. Lots of money ready to, to fly in for your while. And also something that's very nice as well, I guess, against this sort of constant lane push from T1 now, just having that extra mechanism to sort of be able to shove a lane in back against T1. Oh, absolutely. Luna's probably the only hero in the game yeah. where one illusion can cl clear multiple creep waves. on the hunt for Zephyr. But again, Zephyr loves this. You know, this is this is what he lives for. He lives for the space that he's making and for the attention that he's getting here from uh, Quincy Crew. Because they won't spend uh, Blink too force. long hunting from this time. And he's all he's about that sort of mobility. sliding all over the place. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he's not involved in the action. He just wants to split waves and uh, play this constant sort of Dota. just taking away this ability for, for Quincy Crew to push in. Quincy Crew, well, they got creep wave down bottom. They've just got, is it one range creep? It's just the one little range creep, but he's going to do enough to take down this backdoor protection. Put the Most fortification, but it's going to be a hard hit and push here from Quincy Crew here, as uh, they're getting hyped up as well for that last fight that we saw them able to take, and the damage will be done. Finally, Quincy Crew will manage to apply the pressure to the high ground, take the bottom set very quickly. I mean, this is the thing. Once you're not able to keep them away from the base, when they actually get to it, with this DP and Luna, they shred through the objectives. Carl is going to get in on the, the front lines here with the blink. Coming onto his BKB, they'll turn with the sprout onto Quinn. There's Lau. Stepping in with the Shiva's guard. But Quincy Crew, they just focus the objectives in, making sure that they get what they came for, and they will. This is going to be a second set of racks that Quincy Crew are able to take down as they finally break around all sort of the all the games that T1's trying to play outside and away from their bases. Huge objectives, they're ready to push on for more. They're not going anywhere here, Quincy Crew. Straight over to the tier fours. They're looking to close this Cancels. one out. T1, they've got to respond. They've got to respond soon. So what do we have yes, going on hot. here? Here he is, he's ready to jump into the back lines. Cuckoo's getting focused. The first Ravage is going to come out. They've caught him. They've got the control on the 23 Savage. 23 Savage is trying to run the overgrowth. 
will hold them back, give time for 23 Savage to head out to side. White Mon, he's in with the three-man cookie, turns with the blast over towards LOA, but it's not enough damage. LOA, he's got the curse control on the Cuckoo. Cuckoo brought back for this, but Cuckoo, he's gonna go down for sure. You put the BKB, no, the invis, if they got detection, they don't. Cuckoo will be able to sneak away. Quincy Crew, they're ignoring, they wanna end this game. They're back onto the ancient Yawa, looking to close this game up. If they've got any chance of pushing them away from this T1, Yawa, he's fighting right up until his last breath. They're in with the stuns. Quincy hit the ancient, they're looking to close in time and they'll able to do so. Quincy Crew, they'll close it up. This game one will go to them here. And my goodness, T1, they certainly try.